On the Shortness of Life by Seneca Chapter 1 The majority of mortals, Paulinus, complain bitterly of the spitefulness of nature, because we are born for a brief span of life, because even this space that has been granted us rushes by so speedily and so swift that all save a very few find life at an end just when they are getting ready to live. Nor is it merely the common herd and the unthinking crowd that bemoan what is, as men deem it, a universal ill. The same feeling has called forth complaint also from men who were famous. It was this that made the greatest of physicians exclaim that life is short, art is long. It was this that led Aristotle, while expostulating with nature, to enter an indictment most unbecoming of a wise man, that, in point of age, she has shown such favor to animals that they drag out five or ten lifetimes, but that a much shorter limit is fixed for man, though he is born for so many and such great achievements. It is not that we have a short space of time, but that we waste much of it. Life is long enough, and it has been given in sufficiently generous measure to allow the accomplishment of the very greatest things, if the whole of it is well invested. But when it is squandered in luxury and carelessness, when it is devoted to no good end, forced at last by the ultimate necessity, we perceive that it has passed away before we were aware that it was passing. So it is. The life we receive is not short, but we make it so. Nor do we have any lack of it, but are wasteful of it. Just as great and princely wealth is scattered in a moment when it comes into the hands of a bad owner, while wealth, however limited, if it is entrusted to a good guardian, increases by use. So our life is amply long for him who orders it properly. Chapter 2 Why do we complain of nature? She has shown herself kindly. Life, if you know how to use it, is long, but one man is possessed by an avarice that is insatiable, another by a toilsome devotion to tasks that are useless. One man is besotted with wine, another is paralyzed by sloth. One man is exhausted by an ambition that always hangs upon the decision of others, another, driven on by the greed of the traitor, is led over all lands and all seas by the hope of gain. Some are tormented by a passion for war, and are always either bent upon inflicting danger upon others, or concerned about their own. Some there are who are worn out by voluntary servitude and a thankless attendance upon the great. Many are kept busy either in the pursuit of other men's fortune, or in complaining of their own. Many, following no fixed aim, shifting and inconsistent and dissatisfied, are plunged by their fickleness into plans that are ever new. Some have no fixed principle by which to direct their course, but fate takes them unawares while they loll and yawn. So surely does it happen that I cannot doubt that the truth of that utterance which the greatest of poets delivered with all the seeming of an oracle. The part of life we really live is small, for all the rest of existence is not life, but merely time. Vices beset us and surround us on every side, and they do not permit us to rise anew and lift up our eyes for the discernment of truth but they keep us down when once they have overwhelmed us and we are chained to lust. Their victims are never allowed to return to their true selves. If ever they chance to find some release, like the waters of the deep sea which continue to heave even after the storm is past, they are tossed about, and no rest from their lusts abides. Think you that I am speaking of the wretches whose evils are admitted? Look at those whose prosperity men flock to behold. They are smothered by their blessings." To how many are riches a burden? From how many do eloquence and daily straining to display their powers draw forth blood? How many are pale from constant pleasures? To how many does the throng of clients that crowd about them leave no freedom? In short, run through the list of all these men from the lowest to the highest. This man desires an advocate. This one answers the call. That one is on trial. That one defends him. That one gives sentence. No one asserts his claim to himself, every one is wasted for the sake of another. Ask about the men whose names are known by heart, and you will see that these are the marks that distinguish them. A cultivates B, and B cultivates C. No one is his own master. And then certain men show the most senseless indignation. They complain of the insolence of their superiors, because they were too busy to see them when they wished an audience. But can any one have the hardihood to complain of the pride of another when he himself has no time to attend to himself? After all, no matter who you are, the great man does sometimes look toward you, even if his face is insolent. 
He does sometimes condescend to listen to your words. He permits you to appear at his side. But you never deign to look upon yourself, to give ear to yourself. There is no reason, therefore, to count any one in debt for such services, seeing that when you performed them you had no wish for another's company, but could not endure your own. Chapter 3 Though all the brilliant intellects of the ages were to concentrate upon this one theme, never could they adequately express their wonder at this dense darkness of the human mind. Men do not suffer anyone to seize their estates, and they rush to stones and arms if there is even the slightest dispute about the limit of their lands, yet they allow others to trespass upon their life. Nay, they themselves even lead in those who will eventually possess it. No one is to be found who is willing to distribute his money, yet among how many does each one of us distribute his life? In guarding their fortune, men are often close-fisted, yet when it comes to the matter of wasting time, in the case of the one thing in which it is right to be miserly, they show themselves most prodigal. And so I should like to lay hold upon someone from the company of older men and say, I see that you have reached the farthest limit of human life. You are pressing hard upon your hundredth year, or are even beyond it. Come now, recall your life, and make a reckoning. Consider how much of your time was taken up with a moneylender, how much with a mistress, how much with a patron, how much with a client, how much in wrangling with your wife, how much in punishing your slaves, how much in rushing about the city on social duties. Add the diseases which we have caused by our own acts, add to you the time that has lain idle and unused. You will see that you have fewer years to your credit than you count. Look back in memory and consider when you ever had a fixed plan, how few days passed as you had intended, when you were ever at your own disposal, when your face even wore its natural expression, when your mind was ever unperturbed, what work you have achieved in so long a life, how many have robbed you of life when you were not aware of what you were losing, how much was taken up in useless sorrow, in foolish joy, in greedy desire, in the allurements of society, how little of yourself was left to you, you will perceive that you are dying before your season. What then is the reason of this? You live as if you were destined to live forever. No thought of your frailty ever enters your head, of how much time has already gone by you take no heed. You squander time as if you drew from a full and abundant supply, though all the while that day which you bestow upon some person or thing is perhaps your last. You have all the fears of mortals and all the desires of immortals. You will hear many men saying, after my fiftieth year I shall retire into leisure, my sixtieth year shall release me from public duties. And what guarantee, pray, have you that your life will last longer? Who will suffer your course to be just as you plan it? Are you not ashamed to reserve for yourself only the remnant of life, and to set apart for wisdom only that time which cannot be devoted to any business? How late it is to begin to live just when we must cease to live! What foolish forgetfulness of mortality to postpone wholesome plans to the fiftieth and sixtieth year, and to intend to begin life at a point which few have attained. Chapter 4 You will see that the most powerful and highly placed men let drop remarks in which they long for leisure, acclaim it, and prefer it to all their blessings. They desire at times, if it could be with safety, to descend from their high pinnacle, for though nothing from without should assail or shatter, fortune of its very self comes crashing down. The deified Augustus, to whom the gods vouchsafed more than any other man, did not cease to pray for rest and to seek his release from public affairs. All his conversation ever reverted to this subject, his hope of leisure. This was the sweet, even if vain, consolation with which he would gladden his labors, that he would one day live for himself. In a letter addressed to the Senate, in which he had promised that his rest would not be devoid of dignity, nor inconsistent with his former glory, I find these words. But these matters can be shown better by deeds than by promises. Nevertheless, since the joyful reality is still far distant, my desire for that time most earnestly prayed for has led me to forestall some of its delight by the pleasure of words. So desirable a thing did leisure seem that he anticipated it in thought because he could not attain it in reality. He who saw everything depending upon himself alone, who determined the fortune of individuals and of nations, thought most happily of that future day on which he should lay aside his greatness. 
He had discovered how much sweat those blessings that shone throughout all lands drew forth, and how many secret worries they concealed. Forced to pit arms first against his countrymen, then against his colleagues, and lastly against his relatives, he shed blood on land and sea. Through Macedonia, Sicily, Egypt, Syria, and Asia, and almost all countries he followed the path of battle. And when his troops were weary of shedding Roman blood, he turned them to foreign wars. While he was pacifying the Alpine regions, and subduing the enemies planted in the midst of a peaceful empire, while he was extending its bounds even beyond the Rhine and the Euphrates and the Danube, in Rome itself the swords of Mirena, Caepio, Lydippus, Ignatius, and others were being wedded to slay him. Not yet had he escaped their plots when his daughter and all the noble youths who were bound to her by adultery as by a sacred oath oft alarmed his failing years, and there was Paulus, and a second time the need to fear a woman in league with Antony. When he had cut away these ulcers together with the limbs themselves, others would grow in their place, just as in a body that was overburdened with blood there was always a rupture somewhere. And so he longed for leisure, in the hope and thought of which he found relief for his labors. This was the prayer of one who was able to answer the prayers of mankind. Chapter 5 Marcus Cicero, long flung among men like Catiline and Claudius and Pompey and Crassus, some open enemies, others doubtful friends, as he tossed to and fro along with the state and seeks to keep it from destruction, to be at last swept away, unable as he was to be restful in prosperity or patient in adversity. How many times does he curse that very consulship of his, which he had lauded without end, though not without reason? How tearful the words he uses in the letter written to Atticus, when Pompey the Elder has been conquered, and the son was still trying to restore his shattered arms in Spain. Do you ask, he said, what I am doing here? I am lingering in my Tusculan villa half a prisoner. He then proceeds to other statements in which he bewails his former life and complains of the present and despairs of the future. Cicero said that he was half a prisoner, but in very truth, never will the wise man resort to so lowly a term, never will he be half a prisoner, he who always possesses an undiminished and stable liberty, being free and his own master and towering over all others, for what can possibly be above him who is above fortune? 